Adam here again. Just the usual warning that this podcast deals with adult themes and there's a bit of swearing in this episode. Gone Fishing, Part 8. Gone Fishing. No, nothing in that. Do we need to help you get this out? <laughs> Hang on, I'm just going to like put this down because I think something must have dropped. Maybe the unit next door is someone's... We really don't want to see you crushed to death inside your own unit. It's not the story we're trying to tell. <laughs> So I've been here a few times, so I kind of... I just I've been talking to Gail Maney on and off for two years, but most of the times you've heard her on tape are from three days early in 2018. We talked with her in her small apartment, but she also took us to the storage locker where she keeps most of her stuff. Um, well, I know there's four full boxes at my place, and there could be just a couple here. Gail's looking for documents about her murder conviction in her prison time and her attempts to prove her innocence. But there's a few surprises in here too. Guns and Roses ticket from 1993. <laughs> <laughs> that Smart Stadium. I went to a few concerts back in my day. Yeah. <laughs> I've been to Metallica and um, Pink Floyd. Um, yeah. It was at Western Springs Pink Floyd. It was a pretty good concert actually. Yeah. Her storage units in one of those huge soulless steel and concrete places where a long central corridor leads to hundreds of identical lockups. Her unit's not terribly big considering it holds almost everything Gail owns. It's a few metres wide, maybe five metres deep. But it's tall and packed to the ceiling. Chairs, tables, cupboards, lamps, a stereo, a washing machine. Cardboard boxes are crammed with all the bits and pieces of a life. Photo albums, letters, accounts, diplomas, some art. The furniture in the boxes are stacked really high. Maybe too high. Oh my god! Oh jeez. <laughs> Sorry, Amy. No, it's fine. Oh my god, I didn't even see it come down. You saved me. Oh, I like it. Yeah, so luckily Gail catches that chair before it hits me on the head. But despite the dangers, the trip's worth it. Gail finds diaries and some useful court documents. And she also finds a manuscript, a thick sheaf of typed A4. It's a memoir Gail started writing in prison. It's partly about her conviction for the murder of Dean Fuller Sands, but the first chapter is about her childhood. Gail lets me read it, and like her diaries, it's full of private stuff she doesn't want to share. Some of the childhood stuff is really tough. There are some big clues in there about why Gail Maney went off the rails later in life. It's in this chapter that I found that little story we told, right at the start of the series. The one about the day when Gail and Tanya are just six and they take a box of matches into the Glendine bush and try to cook potatoes. The one about the time they play with fire and everything goes up in flames. The one about the time in the classroom the next day when Tanya Wilson points the finger at her friend Gail Maney for the first time. Stuff and RNZ, this is Gone Fishing, a podcast by Amy Maas and me, Adam Dudding. This girl here's like, she's in England now, she's, um, she got deported. But um, she's a cage fighter over there. She's like really, fa- like really famous, like a uh, champion kind of thing over over in um, England. And she's got her own um, security company. Gail also yeah, finds a scrapbook really well. in her unit. It's full of notes and artwork and messages written for her by some of the women she met in prison. Yeah. So here's just some of the memories from the, some Aww, of the girls I did get really closer to. <sighs> Gail Maney spent 15 years in prison. She's out now, but with a life sentence, you're always on notice. Break any of the strict parole conditions and you're back inside. Gail has been recalled twice since her first release in 2010. In prison and out, she's never stopped saying she's innocent. 
when I got convicted the second time, then I started doing some kind of research and I just started writing to all these people just saying, help me, you know, just to have a voice out there. So I wrote to the Minister of Justice, the Governor-General, the Minister of, Pol- I think, was it the Police Complaints Authority? I mean, I was all those kind of people saying, look, I'm innocent, I, you know, pl- please help me, just trying to get them to listen or take, so it's a long process. Yeah. So yes, I wrote to Joe Karam as well because he was helping David Bain and um, he never got back to me, you know, but as time went on, I kind of understand that it's just such a huge undertaking and it's and it's time consuming and there's a lot involved. I did a um, synopsis for um, the Auckland Law Faculty and they had the Miscarriages of Justice Seminar in 2004, I think it was. So I sort of wrote my own perspective um, on why we need a Criminal Cases Review Commission in New Zealand. I wrote to, um, who's the guy that does the Sensible Sentencing Trust, Garth McVicker? So I wrote to him and told him that I was innocent and um, he actually wished me luck, which was quite surprising. There's one possibility, though, that really feels like it could go somewhere. The Crown thought they had an open and shut case when four witnesses implicated Gail Maney in the crime. Two of the witnesses repeatedly changed their story, and now a key Crown witness has come forward to tell us she lied. Not long after the second trial, Gail learned that her old friend, Tanya Wilson, has changed her tune. Tanya's now saying she lied at trial, and she wants to retract most of what she said about Gail. These things move slow. As early as 2001, Tanya Wilson talks to the private investigator John Bradley about wanting to recant. In 2003, she signs an affidavit detailing her lies in court. In 2004, she talks to the investigative TV show Sunday about the same thing. And finally, in 2005, Tanya appears in front of the Court of Appeal, where Gail Maney's lawyer, Peter Kay, is asking for a third trial for Gail. Here's some of what Tanya Wilson says in that affidavit. She steps through a timeline of moving into Larnock Road in late 1989 and pulling Gail Maney into her world of drugs and prostitution. She talks about the two of them meeting Stephen Stone, and like everyone, she can't resist mentioning that they all had a threesome. Her timeline roughly matches what we've heard from Gail, in that they don't meet Stone until quite a while after Tanya becomes a flatmate at Larnock Road. Tanya doesn't spell it out in the affidavit, but the point here is that she and Gail aren't meeting Stone until after the date of Dean Fulisane's disappearance. Tanya writes that in 1997, the police come to her to ask about a tip-off they've just received. Apparently, she's been heard talking about seeing a body in a boot back in the day. At this point, Tanya says in her affidavit, she tells police the truth. And the truth is that, yep, in late 1989, she was at Larnock Road with Gail and with their friend Sonia when Stephen Stone and Colin Maney turned up in a car and Stone invited the girls to come and look because he had a body in the boot. You might recognise this story. It's the central scene from what we have called Scenario 1. The women all said no, but Stone said, go on, look out the window. Tanya says she looked. She saw Stone's car parked near the garage with its boot open, but she couldn't see what was in there or identify it as a body. The guys drove off. Later, though, she heard Colin Maney say he'd had to break a leg to get the body into the boot and she also saw some blood in the boot of Stone's car, which Stone washed away using a hose at Larnock Road. But it's the second half of Tanya's affidavit that's really important. She claims that police then pressured her to go way beyond her early true statement and add a pile more claims that weren't true. Fifteen years have passed since she wrote this affidavit, but we want to know if Tanya still stands by it. We know Tanya lives in a North Island town, but we don't have an address or a phone number. She's got a different last name now, but we decide to try the local bars. At the first place we visit, we get blank looks. So we try somewhere else. We asked the manager in this bar if he knows anyone called Tanya, but it's so loud we can't hear his answer. He tells us to come out the back. You're right, it's all the 
And we ask again if he knows Tanya or where we might find her. So off, how are you? Uh, my, my name's Amy, I'm a journalist with Radio New Zealand and this is Adam, he's a journalist with Star. So what's this about? It's about a situation Tanya was involved in quite a while ago. Yeah, but you can't go around here and, and think because it's not even free to court yet. Oh, no, this is... No, um, this is this not is something thing. that's current. This is another, this isn't the current. It's not a current. We don't know about the you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> What's that thing? Bingo. This bar manager does know Tanya, and it seems there's something complicated going on with her that we know nothing about. But he relaxes when we explain that the thing we're talking about is from decades ago. In fact, he's so keen to help, he jumps in his car and orders us to follow him. So in the second half of that 2003 affidavit, Tanya accuses the police of coaching her into telling lies. She says they warned her she could be prosecuted as an accomplice. She was scared she would lose her children, so she said what she thought they wanted to hear. She claims it was the police who told her the body was Dean Fuller Sands. She says police told her to say Gail had taken out a hit on Dean. And then, much later, After the police interviews with Neil and Martin, which loop in the Leah Stevens murder and rape as well, Tanya says police told her to change her story again to match this, to match scenario two. That's the version where Dean is shot by all those guys in the Larnock Road garage and Leah is killed by Stone five days later in Tanya's bedroom with Neil and Martin watching. In the affidavit, Tanya says she did slightly know Neil and Martin and Leah all through the Chaplin strip club but she makes a string of specific retractions of things she'd earlier said under oath in court. She didn't see Dean Fuller Sands get shot at Larnock Road in the garage. She never saw Dean or his car at Larnock Road at any time. She never saw Martin at Larnock Road. She saw Neil at Larnock Road once, but it was outside in Stevenstone's car and he didn't come in. She never saw Leah Stevens at Larnock Road and she did not witness her rape or her murder. She wraps up the affidavit by saying, All of this evidence is false, and my first statements to the police about Stone arriving and saying he had a body in the car is the truth of the matter. She says she hasn't been threatened or coerced to make these retractions. She's sorry for the lies, but was doing amphetamines at the time and was under a lot of pressure from police. But now she's getting her drug use under control and has a stable life. She's happy for the affidavit to be presented as part of Gail Maney's appeal for a new trial. So that's what Tanya is saying in 2003. If everything Tanya says in that 2003 affidavit is true, that could really put Gail's conviction in question. And now, on a sunny afternoon, 15 years on, it looks like we might be able to ask her about it ourselves. The drive from the bar to Tanya's isn't far, and soon we're delivered directly to the doorstep of someone we hadn't really expected to find. Small town New Zealand is a friendly place. Tanya's home. When she invites us in, she seems a little bit spaced out, so we double check. Is she really okay talking to us about Gail? Yep, says Tanya. Come on in. Oh, here's your room. I'm packing at the moment, so oh, sure. excuse the, because um, um, the landlord didn't pay his rent. So. Oh, that's a shame. Oh, shame. Tanya has a bedroom in a shared flat. She's been there about six months, but she's about to move. Something's gone wrong with her tenancy. Like she says, her room's messy with boxes and bags everywhere. There's an open can of elephant lager on the floor. Tanya's dark cat's eye makeup looks like it was done with permanent marker. There are lots of bruises and scabs on her legs. Her hair is tangled. As she clears a space for me to sit on the bed beside her, she says, Have a seat, love. It's all clean. I ain't got AIDS or anything. And before we're quite set up, she already has a question of her own. So what, what's Gail up to? Oh, she's just, you know, trying to get her life back together. Really. Yeah. Um, yeah, trying to piece it all back together. She's still maintaining her innocence. Do you want to open that window that you love? I met Gail a while ago, a few years ago, mm-hmm. and had a chat to her. You guys and... got a license or something? 
It looks like this might be a short interview, so we jump right in, asking Tanya why she recanted. She answers a slightly different question. The cops actually, um, you know, the... Um, Oh, what is, what's his name? The cop in South? Yeah, he's locked up, eh? He's out now, yeah. Oh, he's out now, yeah. He threatened me to tell lies. What did he say to you? That I'll lose my children. And what were the lies that he asked you to tell? That, um, that Steve, Steve Stone is an asshole, okay? Obviously, he's a, you know, he has done a few things. But Gail did not have any involvement at all. And they try to pin that on Gail. And what did what did he tell you that you specifically to lie about? Can you remember? Um a long time. Um if you don't tell us you know, they try and what what police do is they try and put things into your your head. You know, and um, they make their stories. Mm-hmm. So, you know, and you sort of think, because they threaten you as well, and when they say something, they make you believe in your brain, you know, they make you feel as though it, it's true. Yeah. Mm. It's hard to keep Tanya on topic, but she remembers the body in the boot incident well enough. Steve Stone and um, that came back with a car and they said, oh, there's a body in the boot, you know, but we didn't want to look. Did you see the body in the boot? Sort of. I saw legs. Yeah. Did you know Leah Stevens? Yeah. Did you see her being murdered? No. What about Dean? Did you know Dean for the Sands? Yep. You did know him? Yeah. Did he visit you at Larnock Road? Yeah. Yeah, on and off in pubs. And did Gail know him? Oh, probably pass wise, you know. On and off, yeah. Yeah. And did he visit you and Gail at Larnock Road when you were living there? One time couple of times. And was that at like a big party or an intimate Parties. Yeah. Parties. It's good as me. That's why I'm I'm so fucked up, eh? Because of of Mark Franklin. Mm. I'm taking a lot of drugs and I've been drinking a lot because of all of this. I hate it. So why did Tanya recant? I I felt so guilty about the, you know, it wasn't right. And I'm not the sort of person that does things like that. And I wanted to make everything all right because the girl was my friend. And she always have. And we grew up together, you know. And I didn't, it was wrong for me what I said. Tanya is confident of Gail's innocence. With Stephen Stone, though, it's different. What made you so afraid of Stephen Stone that you would want to go into witness protection? He's a murderer. And you He's thought he... a hitman. Do you think the body in the boot was Dean Fuller Sands? Yeah, I, yes. And do you know that, or do you think that? I think that because you didn't see his face. I didn't even go down the boat, okay? I didn't even go down the car. All I saw was legs hanging. Do you remember if the body in the boot was very close in time to the disappearance of Leah? Because the disappearance of Leah is something that people could put a date on, you see. I'm not going to say yes, I'm not going to say no. I do not know, Okay. okay? We ask her a bit more about police coercion, but we're starting to confuse her and she's confusing us. Near the end, Tanya starts talking about her movie collection just as I'm asking her for her cell phone number. And our wires get crossed. I've got heaps of DVDs. <laughs> good on uh, you. Can I, I get you? Can I, no. no, no, I can't have your cell. 
Okay, right? can I have your cell number? Uh, oh, I don't want one of your What's your, your phone I've number? Got, I've got Netflix now. Can I get your phone number? She nods and starts looking through her phone, but we figure there's not much more we can learn from Tanya Wilson. Thank you so much for speaking with us. Well, that was a bit of a surprise. Yeah. Can we get, can we get a photo and even just a, may, a very short piece of video where you say my name? It's hard to know what to make of that. Tanya isn't in great shape during that interview, and as ever, her words might need to be taken with a grain of salt. It's the usual problem. This story is built on the accounts of people who have, without doubt, told lies or given contradictory versions of the same events. That's what made it so hard for the police to put together a coherent narrative. And it's what makes it so hard to decide, looking back now, where the truth lies. But what Tanya Wilson tells us in that interview is basically consistent with her 2003 affidavit. Yes, there was a body in a boot, but she only saw it out a window and was never certain about who it was. And she's again denying that she saw Dean getting shot by numerous people in the Larnock Road garage. She's basically saying scenario two is untrue. She's saying police coerced her to tell lies. But even though she's speaking in defence of Gail Maney, some of the things she says aren't totally helpful to Gail. She says maybe Dean Fuller Sands did come to Larnock Road, but Gail has made a huge deal of saying she never met Dean. Oh, I don't know. Despite her blurriness, I think Tanya is being honest with us. I come away more certain than ever that there are serious problems with the case against Gail. And Dean being at Larnock Road, Tanya's vague on that. And she says if he was there, it would have been in a party setting, the kind of environment where you don't necessarily meet everyone who's at your house, that can still match what Gail says. Sure, this is a pretty loose interview, but Tanya's sticking to her guns. That means one of the four key witnesses in this case still says her trial evidence was untrue and coerced. And it's not just Tanya who wavers. Around the same time as private investigator John Bradley talked to Tanya and she wrote her affidavit, Bradley also talked to Sonia, another of the four key witnesses. And apparently, Sonia also told him that her evidence had been untrue. She never saw Dean for Sands being shot in a garage. She never met Leah, and so on. She wouldn't go on the record like Tanya did, which makes this information hearsay. But Bradley made a record of what she said to him and put it in his own affidavit. That's two of the four key witnesses retracting their stories. No question, it seems quite remarkable that two witnesses so central to the case were both saying their evidence was untrue. But in the end, these bombshells have very little impact. The appeal court reconsiders Gail's case in 2005. The appeal judges look at both affidavits. They hear from Tanya, they hear from police, who totally deny any coercion and they decide Gail doesn't deserve a new trial. Quite simply, the three appeal judges just don't believe Tanya. In their ruling, they say, To be blunt, we consider that Tanya Wilson's fresh evidence is utterly lacking in credibility on all relevant matters put in issue. One of their reasons for disbelieving Tanya is that it seems Gail and Tanya were in contact with each other before Tanya made her retractions. There was a letter or letters between them. The court also heard that the two of them were in adjacent cells at Mount Eden Prison because Tanya was jailed there briefly on a totally unrelated thing. But that wasn't true. Gower has explained to us how there's no way they meet face to face simply because of the layout of the prison. Tanya was in a different unit and they weren't in adjacent cells. She got put over in what's called the mods unit, which they had open for the woman, and I was in the main part. We never saw each other. And then I got given a letter from somebody that's from her saying that she wanted to tell the truth and that she was sorry that she'd lied. So the only thing I ever did was pass back a phone number to contact John Bradley. I never wrote, because I was too scared to do anything. So I just gave a phone number and I believe she contacted John Bradley. He was able to go into the prison and interview her. Even now, Gail completely avoids contact with Tanya, just to sidestep any assumptions that she's trying to influence her. I'm just, you know, I'm too scared to, like, even talk to her or anything like that. So I don't want anything to jeopardise trying to um, prove my innocence or clear my name. Sure, that claim about adjacent prison cells does seem to be inaccurate. But 
It may not have been the decisive factor anyway. The appeal judges give eight different reasons for disbelieving Tanya, and the fear that Gail influenced her is only one of those. By her own account, Tanya either lied at the original trials, or she's now lying to the appeal court, and the judges decide it's the latter. She's an unreliable witness. The appeal fails. Something else comes of Tanya's recanting, though. The police do their own internal review of their investigation. We've asked to see the report from that and have been refused. We don't even know the terms of reference, but we do have one tiny piece of it. It's just six pages, which Gail unearthed for us the day we visited her storage locker. And what it shows is that in June 2004, police get back in touch with Martin, one of those two key witnesses who received full immunity from prosecution. A very senior officer, Detective Inspector Stuart Allsop Smith, interviews Martin about what went on during the original police interviews. Those are the ones where Martin gave seven different versions of Leah and Dean's deaths. And these six pages Gail found for us are the statement Martin makes after being interviewed by Allsop Smith. Bizarrely, Martin claims that when he was first interviewed, he had something like recovered memory syndrome. His memories of the crimes were totally repressed, but then they came back. Again, we're using an actor to read from the statement Martin made for Allsop Smith. I saw appeals for the information on TV uh, on the disappearance of Leah Stevens. I honestly thought that I had no knowledge of the events. It was just something that I could not cope with. My mind could not handle it. Martin says he buried the memories for years. When police started interviewing him, he still had no memory whatsoever of seeing the rape and murder of Leah Stevens. Even when police played him video of Neil's statement, where Neil places Martin at the scene as Stephen Stone kills Leah, he still didn't remember it. But then... When they left me on my own for a while, I began wondering and perhaps asking myself, what if? And letting myself open my mind to whether I was there or not. Martin also describes what went on during that half hour alone with Mark Franklin, that little window of time at Henderson Police Station that we've been so hung up on. Remember that right after this half hour with Franklin, Martin suddenly links the Dean Fuller Sands and Leah Stevens murders and tells the Larnock Road garage shooting story for the very first time. Mark came in by himself and said that if I don't tell the truth, I'll end up in a jail cell next to Stephen Stone. I'd been shown over the weekend photos of various places like chaplains and areas I was familiar with. I suddenly started to feel the feelings and emotions that I'd felt at the time of the murders. All of a sudden, the memories flood back. I then just closed my eyes, started shaking and put my head in my hands and recounted the whole story, which included the murder of Dean Fuller Sands. Right at the end, there's a short Q&A, and Martin is directly asked the question that's lurking under all of this. Question. Did the police at any time suggest you adopt a particular scenario of the events surrounding the two incidents you have described? Answer. No, the evidence I have given is 100% the way I remembered it. Wow, that's all interesting, I suppose. The recovered memory stuff is pretty weird, but this is for an internal police review. And Martin got immunity on the condition that he told police the truth. So, a few years later, when another cop asks him if he was lying at the time of the trial, he's hardly going to be motivated to admit that now, is he? The failure of the 2005 appeal is a huge disappointment for Gail, but she doesn't give up. She doesn't like prison, but she's worked out how to survive it. I guess I learned in prison that you can't trust a lot of people because people come and go and they will actually shit on you. (laughs) In the end, I just isolated myself and just got on with my own journey. I would just go to work every day, um, keep myself really busy because that became my way of coping. And then I just would go back to my unit at the end of the day and go to bed. I guess, um, because I'm tired. Gail works her way up to become a team leader in the prison kitchen, where her pay maxes out at 60 cents an hour. That's where she was working when I first met her. But on top of her prison job, she keeps slogging away to prove her innocence. She drafts an application for a royal prerogative of mercy. She appeals, unsuccessfully, to the Supreme Court in 2007. In 2009, she contacts the Innocence Project, an organisation that investigates cases where there may be a miscarriage of justice. 
In 2010, she is contacted by Chris Chevalier. Remember, that's the restorative justice guy who thinks Stephen Stone is innocent. And because of that, he thinks Gail may be innocent too. In fact, and this seems extraordinary to me, he arranges for Gail to meet Dean's brother and mother so she can tell them about her innocence. Yeah, it was quite, it was very emotional. And they asked me a lot of questions and got some answers that they, you know, things that they wanted to know that the police never had told them. According to Gail, that meeting with Wayne Phyllisands and Carol, it was back in 2010, went well. It was friendly and she felt they believed her story. They all went for lunch afterwards. Carol, back when she was still talking to me, said she saw that meeting a little bit differently. She told me Gail had seemed very believable, but she decided Gail was just a very practiced liar. She actually didn't believe a word of what she said. Anyway, Gail is now out of prison and still fighting. She's hoping that talking to the media might help her cause. She's employed, though it's proving hard to find a good job. She's living in an apartment and it's so small she has to keep her own furniture in a storage locker. Because when you're a lifer on parole, it's not easy to get the tenancy you really want. She's about to apply to another justice group, the New Zealand Public Interest Project. Next year, the Labour government is setting up a criminal cases review commission that will consider claims of wrongful conviction. Gail intends to contact them too. She's stubborn. We've interviewed a lot of people for this podcast, but there are quite a few we didn't get. Aside from Gail Maney and the family of Stephen Stone, we wanted to hear from their two co-defendants. Colin Maney and Mark Henriksen were both found guilty of being accessories after the fact to Dean Fulisane's murder. With Mark Henriksen, we almost get there. Early on, I visit the house where he lives with his mother. He isn't in, so I leave my card and he calls me back. As he puts it, anyone who bothers my mother has my attention. We talk for a while and he tells me he had nothing to do with Dean's death. We arrange to meet, but on the day he texts to cancel... He says he thinks it's a setup, whatever that means. I decide to try again anyway and knock on his door. This time, he's home, but he stays inside and yells abuse at me, so I leave. Colin Maney, Gail's little brother, we never track him down. Gail is still in touch with him, but she doesn't want to pass on his contacts. She says she tried to persuade him to talk to us, but he isn't keen. We also really want to hear from Neil and from Martin. We find an email address for Neil, but the conversation is brief. Amy writes a very polite email saying who we are and what we're investigating. Neil emails back with three words, won't come cheap. I reply to him saying, money is not an incentive we can offer, but we'd still like to speak to you. He replies saying, no, please don't contact me again. I've made the New Zealand police aware of your contact. So that's that. We also go looking for Martin. He's got a new name and isn't that easy to find, but very late in the piece, when we're almost done with making this podcast, we managed to get a message to him, and he calls Amy back. It's not a long call. The conversation is mostly about whether he's willing to meet us for a full sit-down interview. Like Neil, Martin asks if there's payment on the table. But he does talk about the case a little. And just to be clear, this is the real Martin you're hearing, not the actor we used earlier to read transcripts. Martin says the deaths of Dean and Leah still haunt him. Last year, I um, even got hypnotised to try and help the um, Fuller Sands family find Dean. Um, they, don't, they don't know. Um, I, went, I went to the hypnotist myself. That's something that's played on my mind for a long, long time. You know, that, that family can't have any closure, so I, I tried to do that, but I wasn't really any more successful than what I have been in the past. It's, it's, um, and it's a tough thing because, it was, you know, it happened at night time. It happened in an area that I don't know intimately, um, you know, it's bush, it's, it's, so it's really hard to pin down um, a location, you know. He's talking about the burial of Dean in the Murawai bush. He repeats the claim that his memories of the crimes were totally suppressed until the police started questioning him. I, I swore black and blue for a week that I had no knowledge of it until, um, until basically, um, yeah, my mind got to a point where it snapped and, and went back to... Um, you know, that time and place, so. And he insists his evidence in court was completely true. He knew Gail. He knew Larnock Road. 
Yeah, yeah, I definitely met her. Like, yeah, her, her brother Colin, um, Tanya Wilson, um, those were the three people that were at the house that I, I remember clear as a bell. Um, yeah. Later, Martin texts me. He's had a think about it and doesn't want to do a formal interview. He says we should just go with what we find in the court transcripts. He ends by writing, Nothing good has ever come from me knowing any of these people, and I don't wish to antagonise them or disrupt my future. Thank you for speaking with me. Whenever I think I've got my head round this case, we hear another voice, or read another document, or receive another text, and once again I'm unsure what to think. We keep learning new little details, some almost by accident. Like when Amy was talking to Jean Davey, Dean Fulisane's old fishing buddy, and Jean mentions in passing... Well, he did mention the girl Leah a few times. I think he had a real soft spot for her, you know, or they had a, they had a connection of some sort. So he, um, he knew Leah? Yeah, I remember him talking about her and he, he, he felt a strong connection with her and, and wanting to help her and you know just just felt like she was a really nice person and couldn't understand why she was leading the lifestyle she was and you know Jean didn't mention this when giving evidence during the trial and sure Dean knowing Leah doesn't prove anything in particular but it gives us another direct connection between the two cases and this is from someone who doesn't have anything to lose or gain by sticking to some police scenario of events it also adds plausibility to something Martin said in a statement. He said Leah is the one person who steps forward to defend Dean when Stone pulls out his gun in the Larnack Road garage. If Dean and Leah had a connection, that makes sense. If Martin comes across as plausible or honest, that's not good for Gail. But here's something else we learned later in the piece, which is helpful to her. It's a letter Gail received while she was in prison. She found it in her files the day we visited her storage unit. The letter is from the ex-partner of Neil. Remember, Neil's the key witness who told police a million different versions of how Stone killed Leah. This woman, we've not mentioned her properly before, but she's the person who first told police that Neil knew something about Leah. So she's the one who got the ball rolling on that whole side of the investigation. So, while Gail's in prison, she gets this letter from this woman she doesn't know at all. It goes in part. Dear Gail, I'm unsure why I choose to write now. However, here goes. I am Neil's former partner. Prior to the trial, Neil shared details of Dean and Leah's demise with me. I am honest in saying your name was never mentioned to me at any time by Neil, when police spoke to me sometime after my separation from Neil, they were the first people to bring your name up. I have no idea of how this is any help to you, but I would like you to know, Neil was never an honest person, and the fact his testimony was relied on so greatly sickens me. We were going to interview this woman, but then she got cold feet. But what she said in our initial chats was consistent with that letter. She says Neil talked about Leah's death. He named other people involved, but he never mentioned anyone called Gail. That seems pretty important to me. This has been the story of two deaths, perhaps two murders. And all along, we've tried not to lose sight of Dean Fuller Sands, the 21-year-old tyre fitter and fisherman who went missing on August the 21st, 1989. We've gone looking for traces of Leah Stevens, a 20-year-old woman who had qualifications in typing and reception work and liked to watch TV and chat with her grandmother. But of course, much of our attention has been on the woman who's been convicted for one of those murders and who says she's simply not guilty. So this has been the story of Gail Maney, mother of five, holder of a bachelor's degree in applied sciences, one-time drug user, former sex worker, ex-convict. Stubborn battler for her own vindication. 
but it's also the story of the guy most responsible for getting that conviction. Do you know the words? Mm. Mark Franklin, former detective inspector, cancer survivor, one-time weed smoker, ex-convict, present-day pub musician. Franklin let us join him at a recent rehearsal. No harm in a bit of extra publicity when you're looking for gigs for your guitar duo. And if you wanted, you could even draw a line connecting Gail Maney's case with Franklin's current circumstances. It was the stress of cases like hers that drove him from the police force after all. But of course, it's what Franklin says in the two interviews he gave us that really matters. Just like you'd expect, he's very happy to talk about the parts of his investigation that he thought were well handled. He's proud of pulling together a case with barely any forensic evidence or definitive crime scenes and without Dean's body. He's pleased that the case was strong enough to convince two juries and survive various appeals. But, and this part is a bit more unusual for a police officer who's talking to media about an old case, he's pretty open about the limitations of the investigation. And when it comes to Mark Franklin's thoughts on the guilt of Gail Maney specifically, things start to get interesting. For Franklin... The big picture is clear. His investigation got pretty close to the truth about two murders and a rape. Certainly close enough that the four convictions were sound. I don't for one minute think that we got everything 100% accurate, but I'm 100% convinced that that, um, Dean Fuller Sandys was killed and Stephen Stone was the killer, um, and that Leah Stevens was killed and that Stephen Stone was his killer. And you're 100% confident that Gail Maney procured I'm 100% I'm 100% sure that Gail was an integral part of this. It was her house, it was her stuff that went missing, and she gave instructions to other people to hit this guy. Now, and the evidence was that it was a contract to kill. Dean Fuller Sandys wouldn't be dead if it wasn't for Gail Maney. Bottom line. She always, always denied it, but at the end of the day, you've got to look at the weight of the evidence from not just one witness, but, you know, four, five, six other witnesses, and a lot of peripheral evidence as well. But Franklin has always been mystified about why Gail didn't take the option that was taken by Tanya and Sonia, and later by Neil and Martin. Tell the full, awful truth about what Stephen Stone did, and we'll find a way to overlook your involvement. Gail was unusual. She put up a brick wall straight away, as did her younger brother. If she'd have chosen to give us some facts rather than just a total denial, then there was every possibility that she would have been um, given the opportunity for immunity, but she chose not to say anything and not to cooperate. It was basically, you're either in the witness stand or you're in the defendant's box, quite frankly, in this case one or the other. That's the choice they had. And I didn't interview her personally, my staff did, but I just got the impression that she just put up a barrier over this and convinced herself that none of this did happen and that Dean Fuller Sandys did go missing fishing, which was the original situation. Franklin has clearly thought about this a bit. He can even imagine a scenario where Gail was involved, but her intent wasn't quite as clear-cut and brutal as the scenario presented in court. My take on that is that these are a bunch of young kids, you know, drinks, drugs, parties, rah, 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 watch probably a lot of TV and, you know, and you get a situation where, oh, you know, burglary, oh, let's put a hit out on him and, you know, yeah, OK, we, we didn't really mean that, but, hey, this guy came along and shot him. That's my take on it, mm-hmm. that perhaps she didn't, perhaps, no, you know, it may have gone further than she thought. A little later in the interview, he suggests a subtly different possibility, a version where Gail's words and actions are even less intentional. Franklin thinks this might explain the words he thought he heard Gail say at the end of the first trial. Is it that she just wanted Stone to rough him up or something like that and things went wrong? You know, we didn't mean to do it. Coming back to that phrase in court, I don't know. He says if Gail had said something like that to police, I knew Dean, I said something rash but I never meant it to go this far, I was angry with Dean but there's no way I wanted him dead. If she'd have come with that line and we'd have put that statement in, there'd be a very good chance that she would have been in the witness box and not as a, an accused. We ask Franklin how he feels about this. 
two men who admit to direct involvement in the rape and murder of Leah Stevens get total immunity. Yet Gail, who going by the hypothetical versions that Franklin has just suggested to us, might have done nothing more than say a few loose words that were misinterpreted, she gets a life sentence. Forget about the strict legality of it all. Is that fair? Well, she had a trial. She had, she had two trials. She was judged by the community um, on the evidence that we put up. She had options, whether to say what she did say to us or whether she wanted to say something more. That was her decision. She had legal advice. What's not fair is that two people lost their lives and their families are grieving. You know, and the, and the police are the ones that are tasked with to get to the bottom of those situations. So we work for the victims of the families and um, if you get caught up in, in murder and mayhem, then you expect the consequences, I'm sorry. Franklin heard from Gail a few years ago. It was a message through Facebook. She said she was out of prison, that she'd been studying psychology, that she was innocent. Franklin didn't reply. Sure, he says, if she were innocent and had spent all that time in jail for nothing... That would be appalling. I did the review of the David Doherty case. Um, So I I know all about innocent people going to jail. Um, I've been to jail myself. It was shock and horrify me. But he's not losing sleep over this one. The case, the evidence, was good enough. We ask what's meant to be our last question for Franklin. It's the thing that's bothered me from the beginning. Without a body, without DNA... How can he be so certain that Dean Fuller Sands was murdered and didn't just get swept off the rocks? How does he know Dean was the body in the boot, in that original tip-off that started this entire investigation? Well, it's not a question about me being sure. But, um, but it's, it's your story. It's, you know, you're the one who pieced the case together, so you have to be sure no. if you're going to present it, if, no. give it to the Crown. No, you're, you're wrong. It's not up to me to be sure. I don't determine guilt or otherwise. I simply investigate it. I put my investigation findings to the Crown. The Crown put it to the jury. The jury make the decision. Okay, let me put it... If there was any doubt, then that's a matter for the jury. But but surely you must have some sort of, of an idea or some sort of conviction that you have the right victim. Yes, I, I think we got it right. I wouldn't have prosecuted. Well, that's what I'm asking. That's what I'm asking. How can you be sure? How can I be 100% sure? I can't. But having said that, I believe that was Dean Fuller Sandys. I can't tell you in one one minute because there's a, a mass of evidence and that's the purpose of the jury. So I accept I can't be sure, but in my own mind and heart, that was Dean Fuller Sandys' body. We're pretty much done challenging Franklin, but then I say the thing you always say at the end of an interview. Is there anything else Franklin wants to add? Can I talk to you on, off the record? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. We can be- I mean, at the end of the day. We're still recording yeah. out loud. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just le- leave me, leave me back into this again. Just um, if you so, can. just um, with Gail, how you know you're 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 basically saying that if there was any other evidence out mm. there that could mm. kind of exonerate her, you'd mm. welcome it because you can't okay. be a hundred percent sure. Okay. Um, all I want to say is that I did the investigation to the best of my ability. Now there are being some questions raised by Gail, and the media have taken this up. In my heart and mind, we've done the right thing. Um, we've done it by the book, uh, the, ju- the judicial system has played its part, but if there is some other information out there that could possibly come in, well, so be it. I'm not saying the police got it 100% right, but we've done what we can in the circumstances. Yeah. And so just to be very clear on that, you can't be convinced 100% that Gail was involved, but based on the evidence. I'm, I was convinced to the extent that I'm, I was confident to recommend a prosecution um, the Crown look at the evidence, the tri- it's been through the trial, but at the end of the day, Stephen Stone knows what happened. You know, I, I, I can't take it any further than I've taken it, except to say that if there is some other evidence out there um, that someone wants to give to the media, then I'm sure that the police would open the books and, and receive that evidence and have another look at it. I mean, at the end of the day, we're, we're not out to convict 
innocent people. That's the last thing any of us w- would want. I mean, I've been out of this for, for 12 years. I've lived my own life. And the only reason I've agreed to come in on my own time is because this case was probably the most significant case I ever had. Yeah. And for my own peace of mind, I like to see developments in it. You know, it was an important part of my life. So, And I'll continue to be interested mm. in it mm. if anything changes. If you're wondering, we spoke off the record with Mark Franklin for only a couple of minutes. And as he says, once he's back on the record, he stands by the investigation he led. But because it's a case without forensics, you can't be 100% sure of the details. And if Gail can be proven innocent, he'd like to hear about it. You can read that in different ways, like just about everything we've heard about this case. You could argue Franklin's making a simple observation about how the justice system works. Juries hear a mass of evidence, some of which might be flawed, and then weigh it all up. So even when you don't have 100% certainty about all the facts, a guilty verdict can still be legitimate. To me, that's the sound of a cop saying, this person we sent to prison, I can't actually be certain she's guilty in the way we said she was. This is the cop who put Gail Maney behind bars. And he's saying there's a little gap there, just enough space for doubt to creep in. There's just enough space for some light to shine on the case of Gail Maney. And I can't help thinking about something Gail said to us when she started talking about her first and only statement to police, which she gave after her arrest for the murder of Dean Fuller Sands. My story's never changed and I don't have to go and look back at the statement that I did on the 3rd of July 1997 to think, well, what did I say back then? It's always been consistent across time because I told the truth back then and I'm still telling the truth now. Gone Fishing is a joint production from Stuff and RNZ, written, presented and produced by Amy Maas and me, Adam Dudding. Our executive producers are Tim Watkin and Justin Gregory for RNZ and Catherine Goldsworthy for Stuff. This episode was engineered by Rangi Pollock, visuals by Jason Dore. You can subscribe to the full eight-part series at Apple Podcasts, Spotify and other podcast providers. You can also go to the Stuff or RNZ homepages to listen or to find details on how to subscribe. Subscribe.